in my humble opinion, some things are more important than others. Certain topics deserve more attention than others. And this particular episode is an example of one of those things, not because of anything I did, ladies and gentlemen, but because of my guests. Hello, everyone. Daniel Feruzin, sixth episode of the Schmoozin' with Feruzin podcast. It was my distinct pleasure to speak with Professor Lori Levinson and Mr. Obi Anthony. Professor Levinson is an educator at the Loyola Law School. She's also on the Loyola Law School Project for the Innocent Board. Mr. Obi Anthony is one of the founders of Exonerated Nation, and he is the first person that Professor Levinson helped get out of jail for a crime that he did not commit. Mr. Anthony spent 17 and a half years in jail for that crime, ladies and gentlemen. And that's just a number that my, my mind can't even wrap itself around. So we wanted to have them come on and discuss not just the, oh, you know, it's terrible to be locked up for a crime you didn't commit. No, we all know that. We wanted to see the emotions. We wanted to see the raw, visceral consequences of what happens when the criminal justice system makes mistakes. When there's shortcomings in that justice system, there are human consequences. And that's what we get to see today. And I'm, I'm not going to lie to you. This was not an easy podcast to record. And goodness gracious, if it was tough on me, imagine what it was like for Mr. Anthony. And yet he answered the questions. He showed the reality. He didn't hide. And I think there's a lot of value in that. It provides a lot of people a perspective that we would not otherwise have. Do me a favor, guys, before we start. If this information is valuable to you, please like, subscribe, comment below. Push this thing as high up in YouTube's algorithm as you can so we can get as many eyeballs on this episode as possible. Thanks, guys. Hello, and welcome to the sixth episode of the Schmoozin' with Feruzin podcast. Uh, I am so excited to be here. As always, your host, Daniel Feruzin. Uh, my friends and everyone who's tuning in, some days, in my opinion, are more important than others. And I'm very privileged here to have two people who are going to give us an insight that we otherwise would not have. We have Professor Lori Levinson from Loyola Law School, as well as Obi Anthony, a former exoneree, or current exoneree, I should say, of the Loyola Project for the Innocent. Um, we're going to be talking about some tough topics here, guys. I am going to, as usual, try to peel back the curtain as much as I can, respectfully, but we're going to try to delve in and hear the things that the average person doesn't hear so as to understand why the projects for exoneration of the wrongfully convicted are so important. Obi, Lori, thank you guys for being here today. Oh, thank you. It's really a pleasure. Yes, yes. Thank you for having me as well. It's definitely. Absolutely. Okay, guys. So let's just hop into it. Let's not waste any time. Professor Levinson, and I may equivocate with your name, Lori, Professor, but I wanted to start with you and I wanted to get some information about you. Guys, if you just Google her name, she's on the television, she's on CNN. She's a professor at Loyola Law School. She's on the board of the Loyola Law School Project for the Innocent. She has quite an impressive resume. I've also been her former student. I could speak forever, but you can just Google her and see all the good stuff. But Professor, why don't you give us a little bit of background about where your career started? I will, but I do want to jump in and say thank you again and say you weren't just a former student. You were one of my more fabulous former students, and we so appreciate you doing this today. So it is odd, I think, for many people to think that Lori Levinson is running an innocence project, given that my background is that I'm a former federal prosecutor. It was my job to bring cases against people. Most of those people ended up in prison. And after I had that stint for a decade as a federal prosecutor, I decided to teach full time. I love to teach and as you might know, I love the law. Um, and as I went into that, and there were a lot of high profile cases that I covered on the news, whether it be Rodney King or OJ Simpson, people started sending me letters from prison saying, help me, I didn't do it. And I don't feel like there's any disposable people, Daniel. So I tried to read every single one and respond to every single one. Um, as I was doing that, my students who are always really the key to any of my success, a group came to me, evening students, and said, Professor Levinson, can we do something that matters? And I looked around and I saw that there were these people in prison, there were things called Innocence Project, and I said, what the heck, we're gonna try that here. And our very first case actually did involve partnering with the Northern California Innocence Project to help on Obi's case. So that's how it all got started with the idea that 
we have to help people who have nowhere else to look for help. Two, two follow-up questions. What is it exactly that the Project for the Innocent does? And what were your first thoughts and feelings when you discovered it? Well, what we do is take a look at what went wrong in the criminal justice system. And the one thing I did learn from being a prosecutor is there are things that go wrong. There are people who cheat. There are prosecutors who cheat. There are law enforcement who cheat. There are judges who are really set in their ways. So, you know, when I first started looking at this, I guess I didn't believe perhaps it was as pervasive. You know, I was one of those people who said, oh no, it's gotta be the really odd case out and boy, did I learn differently. And I learned how hard it actually is to get people justice when they didn't get it the first time. Why, why is the system that way? Why is it stuck in its way like that? Why do people cheat? Well, you know, I think people, Daniel, want to win too much. They don't really realize what's at stake. And they have these impressions, whether it's from the media or, you know, just how the people they've hung out would be that, oh, no, you know, the people who go to prison are dangerous and they have to be put away. And they've never met anybody like Opie, who, in fact, is different from how they grew up, but are not dangerous and they're not even guilty. The system really was set against them. It was stacked against them. They didn't have good lawyers. It was way too easy for people to come in and make false allegations. We could talk about it more, but we now know from the exonerations that you know, 75% of the people who are actually innocent, when DNA shows us, there were eyewitness IDs were terrible at that. Um, so there are many different causes and it's relatively new for people to take a hard look at it. Yeah, I, I could certainly understand that. Obi, if I was to ask you, why do you think, having been through the system, why do you think the system is set in its ways? I mean, again, I, let, me, let me extend my appreciations for being on your show. I uh, really appreciate this opportunity. And I think that, you know, the reason why the system is set in its ways is exactly what Ms. Levinson just stated. Um, it is the, you know, it's the, they have, the system has stepped back from the presumption of innocence and has moved towards the assumption of winning. And so you now have defense attorneys who, you know, they claim a win by accepting a deal. And you have prosecutors who win upon, upon false, you know, allegations and bringing in, you know, the bad things from witnesses to evidence to allowing, allowing cheating cops to, to get away with things and moving those things forward. And so that's what I believe is happening and why they're stuck in their ways is because the presumption of innocence has been removed from the courtroom and the difficultness is in bringing them back, bringing it back into the courtroom is the acknowledgement of the fact that uh, you have innocent individuals in prison. The presumption you, of, oh, go ahead. We use a lot of bad mechanisms to prosecute cases. Mm -hmm. Snitches, we should never allow snitches to testify. Confessions. You know, many people falsely confess and that's not something people realize. But if you're young, if you're vulnerable, if you're from a community that's on the outside, there's a lot of pressure on you. So, you know, the things that we thought made a good criminal justice system are a bit perverted at this time. Racism, hey, yeah, it exists. You know, something you said, Obi, is a presumption of innocence and you almost forget, like, that's the way it's supposed to be. And here we are talking about how they may have relinquished that, at least in some cases here. Um, professor, I actually had a question from another one of your former students, Justin Dickerson. And he asked, I'd like to ask a professor how her prior experience as a federal prosecutor has shaped her work with the Loyola Project for the Innocent. Um, I do appreciate and value that experience. I worked with wonderful people. And remember I said there are people who want to win too much. Thankfully, those weren't the people I was working with, which made it hard when I realized there's a different system out there. Um, I think what I realized from that is that you take nothing at face value. You talk to that witness. You don't let it be filtered through law enforcement. You go for the corroboration and you don't demonize the other side. Um, you know, I saw far too many prosecutors make it personal. Uh, from my experience as a federal prosecutor, I was better when it wasn't person. It was about what was the evidence in the case. Hmm. Well, let me ask you, 
Um, and I'd like to ask you both this question. Professor, we'll start with you and then Obi, if you could chime in. Professor, when was the first time you learned of Obi's situation? Well, I learned of this situation by the case from Northern California saying, can you help us out? It was a shooting that took place in Los Angeles. Northern California is not really in the best situation to investigate it. And they had a conflict with a co-defendant. So this was the case that I got. And we did a lot of investigations before I ever met O.B. Anthony. And there was a reason for that, folks. I don't want to be sort of influenced by the person. I need to look for their sake at the case. But I'm going to leave it to Obi to tell you what it was like the first time and where we actually met. We were already in court, starting yeah, the hearing. Three and a half, three and a half years. I mean, like, see, that story there is really is a story because, you know, it goes back to the private investigator who was involved in the case, Deborah Crawford. She used to come and visit me. And she, you know, she was very tight-lipped for a little bit about who my lawyers were. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I was excited about the fact I knew about the Northern California Innocent Project. I didn't know all of those, but I heard about the staff. We spoke with them. I hadn't spoken with Ms. Levinson, but then one day, Deborah Crawford told me her name. She was like, yeah, you know, well, you know, one of your lawyers is, is Lori Levinson. Okay, I'm like, okay, Lori Levinson, like, he was like, that's all I'm going to tell you. You, know, <laughs> you go back and go and look at your books and all of this. And, and I did, right? So I went back, and, you know, to the old outdated law books that we had in there. And it was, they was, some was good, some was bad. And I'm like, man, so I asked a couple people, man, y'all know somebody named Lori Levinson, this and that? He was like, and so I went to the West Law Book. And I, and I seen her name in there. And I seen in there that she wrote the, the stuff on prosecutorial misconduct. And I'm like, Oh my goodness, this is my lawyer. And I have been wanting to see her to three and a half years. So I sat there, kept asking Deborah. She was like, no, Mr. McCain, not yet. And then finally, uh, I'm down in the county jail on the evidentiary hearing, moments before going into court. And uh, in come Ms. Levinson, in come, you know, at that point, I, I said, come Ms. Levinson. I didn't know who she was. She comes into the door and she says, she just comes, you know, you, you gotta understand the plexiglass and the, the holding tail cells is not, they're about like a quarter, about an inch, they're about a little inch thick or so, two inches. She leaned into the window and said to me, do you know John Jones? And I'm like, no, I don't know John Jones. She came back to the window and said, look at me when I'm talking to you. Do you know John Jones? And I'm like, no, I do not know John Jones. After that, she just turned around, went into the courtroom, the bailiff, came in there, pulled me out. And I literally sat there and watched this lady who wrote the law, who loves the law, lay the law down right there in that courtroom. And it was like, I was like, wow, like, okay. It was, it was, it was, it was great. But my first, first time meeting Ms. Levinson was uh, in the holding tank in the uh, courthouse waiting to go in for my everyday jury hearing uh, because she had fought, she, they did investigate for my stuff for three and a half years, so. Yeah, and you know what? Uh, I love Obi. I'm just going to say that openly, everybody. But the way that I could be the best lawyer for him was not to do it out of that emotion, but to ask him the one question I needed the answer to, mm -hmm. to go into that courtroom and help win the case. And uh, But I would say there's been a lot of smiling since then. Right? Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. I'm grateful to know. You know uh, <laughs> You know, Deborah told me like you're gonna be excited when you know you be excited, and now you know uh, we got it's a little running, it's like a little thing now because you know while I was there, it was a book. You know, you know this case was a famous case. It was a New York's bestseller. It was a news reporter who followed this lady around, and it was this book that came out called Killing Seeds and Homicides in L.A. And I had that book, and I used to sit in there, and you know, I used to sit in there, and my, you know, I used to say to myself, it's gonna be some little white lady gonna read this book and say that I got a raw <laughs> deal and going to help me out. <laughs> and she says to me, so about that little old white lady? No, no. <laughs> exactly, exactly. So, no. you know, it's, uh, it, um, I, I think that I fought as hard as I could because I believed in Obi from that very day. Um, and uh, he was honest in answering me. Um, he had worked so hard on his own behalf so how do you not fall in love with Obi? That's what I would say. 
Obi, what, what, when you saw her arguing on your behalf, you were still behind the plexiglass at that point, I assume? No, I was, uh, so they did allow me to be in the courtroom, sitting at the defense table. And, you know, uh, you know, it was, a, you know, it was a crazy thing because going to jail, it was just me and the attorney there, right? The, my defense attorney. But then during the process of my exoneration, I'm sitting at the table with like, all of the awesome stars you could possibly have hmm. to fight for you. And, and then I had the star that burst all of the stars up there in Lori Levinson, giving her, you know, uh, attack on this guy, John Jones. And, uh, <laughs> and you know, on, you know, on, you know, and making a, a mess of the, you know, I don't like to call Scott that, but, you know, making him, you know, the district attorney in that, in that situation kind of, you know, go get things figured out. <laughs> it was, it was, it was great, man. I, you know, I had a, you know, I had a, like she said, I had fought for myself and upwards to 10 and a half, 12 years, all the way up to the, uh, the California Supreme, no, excuse me, all the way up to the, to the ninth circuit, past the ninth circuit, going to, uh, getting a certificate of appealability. So I couldn't go to the United States Supreme Court because I didn't have, I was just a guy trying to trying to get my own help. And then, and I, I say that to say that, you know, all of those multiple years of being told no, deny, not believe, none of that, not getting no kind of, you know, you know, we'll think none of that. They just straight out deny you. Nobody believes you. And then, to be standing, to be sitting in that courtroom and to watch this lady do what she did in there, you know, the, uh, you know, you, you see, you'll get a t the visualization of someone believing you. Mm. You know, you, you have most, you know, you know when people believe in you, you feel that, but to actually to see the witness in, in formation, what that looks like, that it's awesome. So it was awesome. Let's, uh, Professor, let's dig into the details here. Um, who's John Jones and what's his relevance to Obi's case? Okay, John Jones is our least favorite person in the world. I think we can all agree. And you need to know a little background about Obi's case. There was a shooting on, I think, 49th and Figueroa. Yes. And that particular property was used as a brothel, to use the nice word for it. And John Jones was the proprietor. In some words, people call him the pimp of that brothel. And there was a shooting outside and one person died. And then there were two other victims who did not. And the prosecution ended up using John Jones as their key witness. When we came back, they caught, they didn't catch anybody that night. Uh, John Jones went to him and said there was some good Samaritan who had shot after the attackers. And if you can find somebody with a bullet wound, they must've been involved. Obi at that time had been wrongfully incarcerated on a really petty stealing a bicycle type case. But his co-defendant was a guy named Reggie Cole, who actually had an old bullet wound. I think it was eight years old, but that didn't matter to the LAPD. And they decided to target Obi and Reggie. And they made their case with John Jones. He was their star witness. Um, they didn't reveal to Obi's lawyer that John Jones had shot the mother of his child, while she's holding the baby, she was a girl who worked for him, shot her in the head. And he walked away with a manslaughter six months type of deal, which obviously shows a lot of incentive he had to please the police. They also didn't reveal, as I believe, that the LAPD actually used that brothel for their girls, if you get my meaning, and so that they had a lot of reason to invest in John Jones. But the last thing about John Jones and this comes out in the book, and we learned this, is that at the roof of this institution, um, the LAPD was pocketing bullet shells on the night that they were investigating this. And that made us think about, well, wait a second. That shot didn't come from anybody down on the street. It came from the top there. And who was shooting from the top there? That would be John Jones. So Daniel, I spent a lot of time at John Jones Place. I don't even know if that's his real name, to be honest with you. Yeah, his house had refrigerators on the front porch because of the drive-bys and finally kind of got him to admit, 
He never saw Obi do this. But to get him to admit it in the courtroom, that was a heck of an experience. He came in more stone than any witness I've ever seen. Am I right, Obi? He's wearing yeah, sunglasses we were, and the we like. He wearing glasses, jewelry. He had the whole look. And I got to do the cross-examination that you only dream of, oh. you know, beyond any of my dreams, even as a prosecutor. That's who John Jones is. John Jones is the guy who put Obi in prison, and he's the guy we had to help us get Obi out of prison. Yeah. Uh, I mean, he and some other witnesses who tested him. Yeah, and you know, just to talk to you a little bit about how much he you know, had to go in there and cross-examine this guy, John Jones. You know, she mentioned it about, you know, this this so-called, they called him an unknown, the, the unknown citizen who subsequently got involved in the in the, uh, in the the debacle that was going on that night. Well, because of her cross-examination, the unknown citizen has now went from an unknown citizen, according to Jones, to a guy with a big yellow hat that was standing on the corner. <laughs> I said, I yeah. said, this is you, not happening. <laughs> this was the most sort of fictional, creative testimony. And, and Daniel, you know, because you're a very experienced and respected wow. lawyer, that your best moment is when witnesses are just making it up. Yeah. Yeah. Because everybody could see it. Yeah, that, that is the point, you know, for, for maybe some people who are watching at home and don't know a lot of what the law revolves around the trial is to allow the jury to have their eyes on the person who's providing testimony. And we can all tell when, when someone's dancing around the answers or whatever it might be. So this sounds like it was a very interesting cross-examination. I assume there's no video, Professor Levinson, of this? There's no video. I would say that all of us there will never forget it. And actually, <laughs> my daughter flew down from college just for the day to be, provide moral support and watch. Uh, I want to mention a couple other key moments in the hearing. It did trouble me that the prosecutor pursued this case when it was really clear that OB had been wrongfully convicted. I think this prosecutor just sort of wouldn't let go. But we found they did not call during the trial both of the shooting victims. And that made me suspicious. So you asked me what benefit there had been of being a prosecutor. I could smell something going on. And my suspicion was because that victim they didn't call would not have supported their case. So Deborah Crawford and I and the investigator went to the south side of Chicago where the prosecutors had shipped this victim. And we walked the streets and we found him. And he came wow. to Los Angeles. And the prosecutor in our hearing stood behind Obi. Do you remember this? Yeah. Stood behind him and said, do you see the person in the courtroom who shot you? Like, that's not too suggestive. And, and Louise, like, you know, is looking, looking, looking. And he finally says, no, it's not that guy. Yeah. Well, that's a good moment, too. That's a good that moment. That was a startling moment for everybody in the court because, you know, Scott, you know, he was, he, Scott was the kind of prosecutor. He was, he was long with his stuff. And so he likes to draw everything out. But then he gets into this moment of, the, you know, where he thinks he had the highlight of his, 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 his cross of when going on. He gets behind me and he literally, guys, he got his hands like right here. Do you, is, do you see the guy? And I'm like, I'm, I'm sitting there like this, like, but I'm looking at Luis too. Cause I know what they did. Like I know the reason why they shipped Luis out, and it's like I'm just hoping like Luis just tell the truth, tell the truth. Mm -hmm. And Luis told the truth, and it was like that was for me. I was just like, oh, that's it. That's that, 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 that was it for me. And so she right. Like it was a couple of things that happened in the in, in that courtroom that I will never forget. That is definitely one. Jones in the big yellow hat is another, and you know. uh, you know, it's, it's, it's amazing, you know, uh, when you really take a look at the things that they did to me in that case, you know, you, you it makes it makes you kind of the way that I am now. Like, you know, it makes you like forever, always after justice, always forever reminding people about the presumption of innocence, always remembering to, to correct individuals in their conversations when they state certain things. And so, uh, you know, I'm always in the in the in the, in the hands of LPI and, and specifically Laurie Levinson. Uh, you know, uh, I wish I could have went to school. I wish I could have been a student in their class 
uh, to be able to enjoy all of the good things that she was that she taught and the ways that she were and to spend those multiple years with her in that kind of capacity. But uh, I've been having, you know, she's been in my life now for 10 years and uh, I've been enjoying every bit of it, I tell you. Uh, I, I can tell you. Oh, Professor, please go ahead. I was going to say, I'm the lucky one. And I also want to give a great deal of credit to the Northern California lawyers, Lynn Starr, Paige Ganab. You know, when you have a phenomenal team, Adam Grant was with us, mm. and you believe and you have someone as righteous as Opie, who has gone through so much, and I know you're going to ask him about it, then you don't dare lose. You just don't dare lose, Dan. Interesting. You guys are saying some things that are going to stick with me. Quite a few things you don't dare lose. And I can appreciate that. We're going to hop into the experience, Obi, in just a moment. But one of the things I want to be very clear here about, ladies and gentlemen, we're talking about the wrongfully convicted. And uh, Professor, I'd like to just go over. So just so I understand, to put the gentleman in front of me in jail, they never interviewed the witnesses, excuse me, not the witnesses, but the victims of the shooting. And because of your experience as a federal prosecutor, that was a red flag for you. And when you finally got the victims, they couldn't point out that it was Obi. Is that correct? Well, I'll just put this nuance onto it. I think they did interview them. I think that they didn't pay attention to the one who didn't support their case. The other witness who testified didn't, wasn't able to identify Obi until I think it was the night before the hearing. And then he yeah, said yeah, he had yeah. a dream. So they influenced his identification and was able to make him a witness, but they weren't able to influence Luis, so they shipped him off. And the reason I could sort of spot that is because I had been a prosecutor, mm -hmm. because I realized this doesn't add up. And, and something, people listening at home, I want you guys to be aware of. When the government comes in and is going to take away, well, let me let me just preface this. When I sue people, all I can do is get injunctions, take money. I'm a civil lawyer. Criminal is a different animal. This is where the government is coming in and saying, you no longer have access to your life. We are taking your liberty away. And in order for the government to do this, they have to prove with a very significant amount of evidence that you actually committed these crimes. So when there is stuff like the, the, the testimony from the actual witnesses is at best wishy-washy, that cuts into the government's argument. And as any citizen of the United States government, as any citizen of the state of California, we should be concerned about things like that because that is our government, how our government is interacting with us. So this stuff is very important. By yeah. the way, everything and, and you, know, you know me, I always interrupt, but I want to add one thing to what you're telling your viewers. You should also be concerned because when you put the wrong person in prison, the real shooter is still out there and they're still hurting people. Yeah. And John Jones shouldn't have been out there. And so that's really a point that we emphasized. And he was he was one of the he was one of the government's witnesses. Simultaneously, this guy had the establishment, as you put it uh, earlier, and he had just shot someone in the head, his the mother of his child. So he had pressure on him as well. And they were using him as their witness. Correct. Jones had a, a lengthy criminal history uh, dating back to the 60s, getting kicked up out of Illinois, having multiple. I just want Ms. Levinson stated that he had multiple identifications and social security numbers. And so no one actually knows whether or not if his name is actually John Jones or not. But the fact of the matter is that not only did, did he, you know, did, did, was he in jeopardy of being violated for all of those things there, but at the time, he was currently being charged with a pimping and pandering and is looking at mandatory state prison time up to 14 years in prison. And based on the fact that in, 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 in the prosecutor withheld that, that they gave him a deal to testify against me based upon those things there. And so, it, you know, they had, you know, you know, they had, you know, for me, long since they already knew who they was dealing with the moment they got, the moment the crime happened outside of the brothel, which they realized that they were utilizing and they also understood that they had an individual there at that brothel that they could use for whatever reasons that they wanted to. And they did just that with John Jones. Let me, let me, we're, we're going to go as long as possible. Obi, as long as you can stay with us. We haven't even gotten to your experience yet, but I have a question. Professor, someone might be watching this and say, okay, well, they have the guy who's running the establishment and they have Obi. Um, they have dirt on the guy who's running the establishment. Why do they need to leverage that to go after Obi? Do they trade in their case against 
the pimp to go after Obi. Why, why victimize Obi in order to help this other guy? Why was that decision made? It's a really important question. I think we're going to have two aspects to the answer. One is because if they got a benefit from that institution, they don't want to shut down their own brothel. The second is because I think too many law enforcement officers sort of look at kids like Obi, and he was young at the time, you know, and say, ah, oh, he's that type of kid, and he's a disposable person. Wow. It, it horrifies me wow. that, you know, Obi doesn't come from the family that looks like Leave it to Beaver, you know, on television or anything. He's a kid who grew up more on the streets of L.A., and he can share that with you. And I think for the cops, they just labeled him. They marked him. What's wrong with getting rid of another Opie? If he didn't do this, he's going to do something in the future. It's that horrifying aspect of how we sort of brand and marginalize people and take their lives away. Yeah. Uh, no, thank you for saying that, Ms. Levinson, because, you know, you know, when we, you know, when I, when I hear that question and when I think about that, the first thing that comes to my mind is the fact that, you know, not not just because the, the sort of the marginalization of the community uh, in which I grew up in. And again, like, you know, uh, and, and, and even the fact that what she said about no one being disposable, but it's the fact you have to remember, remember in 1994 uh, that they had just passed laws to and called us all predators anyway. And it made it so easy for them to do the things that they did because they had the law behind them to come into the communities to go at any mini mighty mode that you know I can do this to this person and, and, and the nail on the head in respect to the brothel is concerned uh, but because they know if they if ultimately if Jones got pressured and felt too pressured then he would then spill the beans about the utilization of the brothel mm -hmm. and they definitely couldn't do, they couldn't put themselves in that type of situation well let me let's this is the part that i actually we, we've already gone over half an hour um and we're just getting to the part that i wanted to spend the most time on i think it's simultaneously the most important and the most delicate and the most difficult uh portion and uh obi i wanted to chat with you and i wanted to break down your experience in three different ways and, and we're going to start before during and after and i would like to start with the before uh, I cannot imagine what it must be like to be sitting in a courtroom knowing you didn't commit a crime and watching these people take away your liberty. And since I don't know, I wanted to open that question to you and not just, oh, it was terrible, it was bad. I mean, what did it feel like? What emotions, what thoughts? I mean, like, you know, the emotions that I felt was a sinking emotion, right? So it's just like, you know, all, you know, I don't know if anybody, you know, you experience going off the, 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 the roller coaster, that drop of this, of your stomach, that, that sinking feeling. And, and you know, it, it's, it's, it goes deeper than that because it's like your spirit just sinks within you because you feel so encapsulated by what's going on around you. You can't break anything. You can't stop it. So it's like, it's a torturous thing Specifically, you know, when, you know, you know, you got the jury coming back in and you already, you know, you've been through this trial process. We're hoping in your mind that, you know, the jury see through the bull stuff, but then ultimately when they don't and they, and, and, and you and the guilty and, the, and that gavel went down for me, you know, I was just like, you know, just, I had just, my mother passed away earlier that year in 1994. And it was just like, I had all, I was already in a lost place, right? So, but then, you know, then you, you know, I get found guilty for something I didn't do. And it was just like, you know, it was, I, it was over. It was, it was like, I was all, it was over. I had, I literally told people it was over. I had, I attempted suicide. I had told the girl that I was messing with, like, I'm, you know, don't, don't ever try to, you know, don't do this and don't do that. I counted myself out because I had no help doing that process. And I realized that in there, I, I would get some help in there. Who gonna listen to me in there? Who's gonna help me in there? Who's gonna, who gonna do anything? So, you know, it, that's that day, all of that just, it was just like, it was just right there. So it was like, 
And it was second, watching your whole thing just go right before you. And you just watch it in the slow motion. But then you get pushed into the back into a cell. Uh, and then you don't, you know, you don't, mentally, I can't say you recover from that. You know what I mean? Because, you know, you get stuck in this kind of place. Like, I like, it's like a time warp type thing. You know what I mean? Like, it's everything stops for you that time. Like, 19, that was it for me, like, and uh, after that, it was just a wash. Everything was a wash, and so it's like being, you know, I forget that word that, you know, when you're stuck between heaven and hell, uh, when you're stuck in, you know, you're stuck in this place of purgatory, you can't do nothing, or it's like when you, when you, you know, you're having a bad dream, and you wake up, and you can't move. And you up though, and, you, and it's just you stuck, and your body still froze. You know that's what it's like. And it's like uh, you can't nothing you can do. It's nothing you can do, man. It is. It was horrific. I tell you, I can't. Uh, you know, when, we, when you talk about not to put it lightly, I can't even think about no light way to think about the air being sapped out of your body, and as you're watching it and you're feeling it happening, there's nothing you have no control of the situation. Let me, if I may, sir, and you let me know if we're going too far. And that's fine. But let me peel back because I want people listening to feel it. I don't want them to just hear it. I want them to feel it. When that gavel came down, I can only imagine the darkest of dark thoughts. Could you tell us a little about it a little bit? And you mentioned a sense of being suicidal, which is something that would have crossed my mind as I was thinking about this. Can you tell us about that? I mean, like, so for me, like I said, when, when that gala went down, only thing that the first thing went to my mind was that I didn't do it. You know, that's the only thing just kept, I didn't do it, I didn't do it. You know, my Cody Finney was right there. He couldn't, and we cuffed up, so you can't do nothing. You just stuck there, but it was just like, I'm just so raged because I couldn't believe that they found me guilty for this stuff. You know, and then it's just like, I don't know, man. It, it, you know, it's, it's, it's like, Again, you can't, it's been tied up and can't do nothing. And it's like, I'm losing my life. And I cannot, I, I, there's no way to real, to kind of the, the best way I would describe that gavel going down, it's like the little thing to chop off your head. And you, it's how stuff you're facing it and watching it coming down. Uh, it's like that. It's like watching a guillotine before it actually hits your head. And it's like, and he, the whole time, you know, he's why he's saying this stuff and it's like, it's going down and you like, you can't, you can tell him to stop, but it ain't for the stop. Nothing like I didn't do it. it ain't, that don't matter. Nothing matters no more. Nothing matters. Like from that point on. And that's the only, and so, yeah, I, I, you know, I, you know, I tried to attempt the suicide because again, I didn't have, you know, I didn't have that mother or the family support or none of that, that made me feel like it was gonna be anything different than over. And so, you know, I counted it out, it was just over, so. Ooh, okay, okay. And then let's, let's move the story forward now. Gavels come down, you've heard the news and you're transitioning and you're transitioning to jail and prison. And I mean, you know, I, I get up in the morning and I brush my teeth and I shower, I do, I do what I want to do. You know, obviously I go to work, but at the end of the day, I want to go to work. Um, and then I got to tell myself, hey, Daniel, that gets taken away. You, you, you're put on lockdown, literally. Um, the people listening at home, probably not going to know anything about this experience. They probably know it's bad, but what does that transition feel like? What does it feel like when you get your liberty taken away? I mean, uh, when you get your liberty taken away like that, and you get shipped off to a prison and I, I was 19 years old. So it, it, it literally made me not be 19 no more. I couldn't because I had to be, you know, I remember, leaving the county jail on the Grey Goose, as they called it, going to Tehachapi, which was the little reception center. And 
I just remember sitting in that seat and saying to myself, like, because I had never been, never went to YA, I had never been to camp, none of that. Just like it. So it was like, uh, I just remember sitting there saying to myself, like, you know, truth would come out. I just don't know when and how, but I'm going to go to jail and this is it. I just kept saying to myself, I'm on my way to jail. And once I got there to the Tehachapi, it was like getting off that bus. Bruh, I don't know, like, you just know, like, you just don't know whether you're going to go back out of that gate again, you know? It's like, if you don't know if that's going to happen. Like, damn, that was the last time I seen the streets. Like, damn, that was the last time I'm going to be on a ride unless I'm on the bus going to another prison on another desert behind another mountain somewhere. You know, it's like I'm just stashed out. But it is it's, so, you know, I don't know, man. You know, if you, your viewers can imagine being driven to no man's land and dropped off, you know, uh, and then not having no direction as to which way to get back to safety or get back to a place where you can get some help. And that's what I, all I remember on that Belts ride there was that, that this is it. Like, I ain't finna see the streets again. Like, this is like this is the last, like, it was just so much happening in my mind. And I had nobody to, like, I couldn't call my mama. You know what I mean? I wanted to, you know what I mean? That's what I wanted to do. Cause I know that like, she would be able to help, but it's just, you know, I, I don't know, like, the best way to do, kind of talk about those things for me is always to talk about it, like to be as descriptive as possible because again, like liberty is something else. Like I think people got to taste a little of that during this quarantine, uh, you know, not being able, just the little stuff, right? Doing the quarantine and I, you know, I got a kick out of it because <laughs> it was like, I was like, wow, man, like where was my stimulus check? <laughs> where was my stimulus check at? <laughs> You know what I'm saying? Like, man, <laughs> because I literally was in there crying. I was I, I was innocent in there, man. And it was like, government didn't come and help me. I couldn't get no stimulus check. I couldn't get no, none of the stuff. And people out here, was they literally was going through it out here with this quarantine. And I'm like, you can still go to the store. You got a yard. You can barbecue on your deck. You can open your windows. You can flush your, you can do all kinds of stuff. There, if they wanted, they could come and they was turning off the water. No water. Your water, you couldn't flush your toilet. Uh, it wasn't going outside to see. It wasn't like, so, you know what I mean? So I'm all, so it makes me make light of the quarantine now. I was like, you know, hey, look, man, like, y'all, you know, definitely you never been to jail. And I don't want you to go, but this is, but that's just a taste of liberty being taken away from you when you can't, you don't got the freedom to go out to the movies like you wanted to. And if you feel like, you know, that's part of your liberty is being taken away, then you know, you definitely don't want to be in a box like that because, you know, uh, you have none of those things to even wish you could have, you know, that was there. Like, so, I don't know. Let me, um, let me just step in here and say, first off, thank you, Obi, for being open. This can't be easy. I. It's not easy for me to ask the questions. It's got to be infinitely more difficult for you to answer them. I don't doubt that. But the people who are watching at home, this is not just a torture session. We're not trying to be, you know, there's a reason for this. And we're going to be putting a link in the video down below for donations for the project for the innocent, as well as Obi's own, uh, own organization that he has, which is Exonerate Nation. Those will be down there. And I need you to think for just a second. You know, you can go this week and go to Starbucks five times and spend $5 a day. Or you can go this weekend and spend $200 on a nice dinner and this, that, or the other thing. We're seeing human suffering exhibited here. And again, thank you, Obi, for being real. Thank you for having the courage to come on here and do this. And the reason for that, guys, is you have a chance sitting there behind your computer right now. You have a chance to make a real difference. I'm not just saying you post something on the internet and you like this or you give someone a high five. No, 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 no. You can make a real difference. DNA tests are, I mean, they're, they're, they're expensive, but they're not that expensive, guys. A couple hundred dollars of your money can literally change the course of a human being with a beating heart's life. So I'm not going to pound it too much, but bear in mind, there is a point to this, okay? And 
let's let's tie it back, Obi. And again, if we're going too far, sir, you let me know. I got to ask you this question because this is what's going through my head as you're talking. I'm visualizing myself in the cell and hearing the door close the first night. What the hell was that like? I mean, I don't think, you know, what that was like, I just I just turned back around and stood at the door, you know? Got this little window, <laughs> this little window about like this big, and you know? You know, I looked up at the guy who was in there, you know, I introduced myself and I just stood at the door because it was like, you have to now figure out who, you can't see who's behind the doors. You only hear voices. And so it's just like, you just got dropped in the lion's den. It was just that scary, bro. Like you just got, and you know, and you know the doors are coming open. You know that the doors are gonna come open. You don't know what's coming out of those doors. You don't know who's in, you don't know none of that stuff. And it was just a, it was just like, hey, you got, you got two choices in this situation. You're going to ball up and get up under the bed or you're going to stand up and get on your feet. And that meant for me in my mind was that I can't, you know, I wasn't, I kept, I told myself this too. I'm not, I'm, I got to get out of here the same way I came into jail. I've never been shot. I've never been stabbed. Never had none of those bad things happen. And I didn't want none of that stuff to happen to me in there. And that's what that was. With that door closed, it was then the mind immediately went to figuring out how I'm going to keep myself safe. That, that, is, that is interesting to me. Um, not, not to objectify the horrible situation you were in, but to, to have that conversation. So the moment the jail cell closed, you actually began strategizing for your safety. Is that, is that the correct interpretation? Yes. And you, you also said they threw me in there in the lion's den. By the way, you keep saying things that I just think are, are, are eye-opening. And you said they threw you in there in the lion's den. We, did, are you referring to the other people who were in there with you? Yeah, yeah, like, so I mean, again, like, man, bro, like, it was already people in there had already been for 19 years already. I was only 19 years old. So it had already been people there in prison for that long already. And you had, you had already had other things, I mean, like, I'm coming from the county jail, so you know it's already violence going on in prison, gang violence, all kind of prison violence, everything. And from all of the stories and things that you've seen and how, you know, you before even being in that place or from TV and everywhere else. So your imagination is already running wild in your head and you don't know who's there and who's around you or none of that. And so, yes, the first thing went through my mind is safety. How am I going to be safe? Because, you know, again, like you just don't know what's behind or who's behind those doors. Uh, is it going to be, you know, you know, you gonna be, are you in a building with with a control guy in a building who wants to have control of the whole building and is running the building like this? Because you come in in the middle of the night and they put you in a cell and then you get out and go out in the morning and now you got now you see everybody. And now it's like, OK. And so you just don't know who's on the other side of that door, whether you're going to where you have an immediate danger or whether it's going to be a, a, a prolonged one, one that is just there around you. Let me, uh, let me ask some more difficult questions. And then professor, I, I would like to bring you in on this. Um, let's talk about that lion's den. Let's talk about, you know, throwing an innocent person in jail and, and what they experience. I, I think everyone, whether or not, you know, they study these things is, is sure that there is violence, there is sexual abuse, there's psychological torment. Um, but I wanted to illustrate that picture in detail and really drive it home. What did you see in there? What, what sticks with you till this day? Well, I'll tell you about this. So, you know, I got to my prison, my, my feet touched the penitentiary grounds, January, 1996. I was on Alpha Yard at Old Corcoran. Uh, they had uh, on Charlie Yard, they had a big old riot between the, the cops and the inmates. And so they was just letting everybody off and they was also moving the yards around. And so, you know, I had to end up, you know, I was on Alpha, they ended up moving me over to the Bravo Yard 
And I was there at that point now going on about a year, year and a half. And uh, I joke you not, bro, like this is exactly, you know, I remember this like, you know, it was yesterday. Go to child. So I'm up in the morning, Saturday morning. Every Saturday morning in prison, they have the exact same thing. Either it's a pancake, a waffle, something was served. You definitely get something was served. One of the two. French toast pancake. But this day was a pancake day. And I'm in line. It's a guy in front of me. I'm walking with my guy behind me. We all we going through the child line. You got to take your tray off of the line. So it's not like you can say, I want this, I want that. You take what's on the plate, right? And so uh, the guy, it was, you know, he didn't want the pancake. He said it wasn't done. He was like, it's too light. I don't want that pancake. I don't want that. Let me get that other plate right there. And the, and, the, and the guy he was talking to was a Hispanic guy. The guy who was getting the plate was a black guy. And the Hispanic guy said, look, man, I'm not cooking it. I'm just here serving the plates. So the black guy reached over and grabbed a whole other plate and just left off. Like, all right, I'm gone. So now, you know, the line keeps moving. The Mexican guy leaves off from there, walks away from the, go talk to his friends. And I joke, you know, I sat there at the table with the dudes all the way and I told him, look, man, something's gonna happen. Like that dude just sat there and just totally disrespected that guy in the line, just reached right over there. And December, 1998, uh, that afternoon, it was a full blown ride on the yard. Full blown ride between the Mexicans and the blacks. Uh, black, this Mexican guy got shot in the back uh, by the guy in the tower because they are, they got real bullets. They got it, you know, and they shot the guy in the back with a M1, uh, whatever assault rifle they have up there and uh, killed him. He wasn't even, you know, he was right there. I was right there. Like the guy was literally trying to get away from all of the stuff that was happening and the dude in the tower was shooting that was was trying to shoot at this one group that was over there stabbing each other. And he was shooting at them and missed, shot that guy in the back. He falls out. You know, that, that's, you know, and again, I'm always saying to myself, like, that was not gonna be me. Not gonna be me. Like, it's not gonna be me. I'm never gonna be in that situation where, you know, and so I'm always, so I always watched him every time something was happening on the yard. I, my first reaction was to look at the dude in the tower and find out where he pointed that gun at. Where is he pointing that gun? Which way is he pointing the gun? Because, and I didn't care, like, you know, this stuff happening on the yard. Like, but hey, where is the gun at? Because ain't no warning shots in there. And they shoot to kill just like they did that day. That sticks, that stays with me. The other thing that stays with me is again, like, dinner time. We on our way to the chow hall. And, you know, I tell people this because I was so startled by it that it literally made me change my mode of operation, how I moved around with individuals in there. But it was just white guys, they was in front of us and they was laughing and talking. And then they just start stabbing this one guy up, the one that was with him. Just literally just start stabbing him up. And I'm like, wow. And the dude in the tower is yelling to get out. All, this, every, all the commotion started happening. And the guy is trying to get away and he's just yelling, hey, look, asking what this is all about. And I'm like, they was just laughing and joking with this dude. Like, so for me, it immediately put me on my worry about the dudes who I was walking around with. Like, can they be laughing and joking and want to stab me? Like, oh, heck no. Oh, I'm not, oh, no, no, no. And so, uh, again, that was a immediately change in my direction. Again, you you know, you know have those moments in there because, you know, you, you think just when you've seen it all, something else happens. And it makes you kind of have to scrap that and have to go into another direction because, you know, I just, you know, I, I couldn't fathom. We're here, these dudes, we all, I'm thinking I'm cool and everything and all of this stuff, and then they just start stabbing me up. Cause that's exactly what happened to that dude. And I can never forget that because again, like, like it's literally like right in front of me, like we in line, we go we got to walk around from, to the building over to the chow hall, and, you know, people be walking in the line and it just was right there like that. And so, you know, I can never forget none of that stuff. It's like, uh, I, I, you know, people there used to, you know, they used to always just tell me, hey, look, hey, they used to tell me like, everything ain't that funny or, you know, y'all can't make a joke about everything and this and that. And I'm all, I was always the guy that wanted to kind of distract you off of the, the angriness that you may be on with laughter. 
try to make a light out of it. Because, again, I was so concerned about my safety. I don't want to get hurt here. And so I always try to throw people off like that and try to keep myself out of the way. You know, it works sometimes, but it didn't work all of the time. You know, I got into a, you know, I got into a real bad fight in there where I had to spend like 11 months in the hole because of it. You know what I mean? And, uh, and so, you know, it's not no fun thing to like to be kind of, you know, pondered upon uh, not only by the inmates, but also by the correction officers uh, during the time of the breakup. Because, you know, you know, what a lot of people don't know is this, that, that it's, it's racism everywhere. No, I don't care what nobody, you know, it's, they just everywhere. And, and, and I can show you the way that they do it there is this. And it's not something that I think that is an intentional thing like some of the time, but just a, just a kind of that's what it is thing. And so uh, so you, when you have two different groups that are fighting, a Mexican and a black guy, and because the institutions are, you know, the minorities that work in the institutions are very low. So you may have, you know, maybe two or three black correction officers on the yard where the rest of them are Mexicans and whites. And so when they come in and breaking up the fights, it's mostly Mexicans and whites. And so the black guy get pulled upon and the other guy get pulled away. And vice versa when it's or when it's a Mexican and a white. And so, you know, I, I, you know, are they doing that purposefully? I don't, you know, you, you have to wonder because it, that's it happened that much. And so uh, you know, doing, you know, like I said, when I I, you know, I, I had experienced that personally. Uh, again, when I got into that fight out on the yard. And so, uh, you know, I don't think a lot of people realize and understand that, that that even happens in there like that, where you have to, you know, you have to defend yourself from all of that kind of stuff. Let me, uh, whew, let me, uh, Professor, let me, let me bring you in here. And let me, let me ask you, you have experience on both ends as a, as a prosecutor and now what you do now for the project for the innocent um what do you hear in terms of sexual abuse what do you hear in terms of psychological abuse and violence what, what is it that people who are listening to this don't know everyone knows bad things happen but what are the stories that we don't know let me first ask obi you okay yes i'm okay i mean Again, you know, this is the uh, thing, traumatic stress. Okay. Um, it happens, everybody. And a lot of it just doesn't get talked about at all because it doesn't get better when people complain. In fact, it gets worse for them. And so it really takes a remarkable person, a remarkable situation to get, you know, the administration and then people outside the prison to pay attention. We are far too complicit with it. Um, I actually prosecuted prison violence when I was a federal prosecutor. The victims generally don't want to testify, so that's very difficult. The guards themselves don't want to be blamed. So we don't have much transparency, and we don't care because, again, we treat people as disposable. I get physically ill when I hear people, and you do hear them say, well, they got themselves into this situation, you know? You know, if you did the crime, you have to do the time. And I said to them, they're not sentenced to being sexually abused. They're not sentenced to being stabbed and shanked. Right. They're sentenced, even if they did it. Right. This is not the punishment. Right. So I think that in our society, we have to stop thinking about it that way that you're going somewhere else, that we don't have to see what's going on, we don't have to pay attention. In my mind, we should judge our civilization by how we treat people who have no power to protect themselves. And I feel strongly about that, Dan. What, um, and, and I, I agree with you, it's a conversation that's not had, you know, lock them up and throw away the key and don't think about it twice. The people who are driving by my house right now are not thinking about this. What is it about being locked up that you know that the average person doesn't, Professor? What, what should we know about that experience beyond what we've heard today? Well, I think what you heard today is part of the Ross expression of it. And frankly, every time Obi speaks, I learn a little bit more about what kind of soul it took to survive this. So I would say to people, it's not numbers, it's not criminals, 
with people. And if you can just identify with the individual, even the guilty individuals about what their lives are about, if you could just pause for a minute and care about the person, that's what people need to do. And we don't do that too much. We sort of make an us and the others way too often. Yeah. Um, okay. And Obi, I want to be respectful of your time. I, uh, a couple of more things, certainly I would like to speak with you about. Professor, obviously, would love to continue speaking with you, even if Obi has to go. Let's just see how much of this we can get in here. Um, maybe it's time to switch over to a more positive topic. And before I do, ladies and gentlemen, uh, you've seen what you need to see to know what it is you have to do. I don't care if it's $25. Something should be put out of all of our prod pockets and donated to these organizations. These organizations are helping human beings with heartbeats, a heartbeat that is being displayed to you in, in, in as the professor said, it rawly, in a very raw fashion. There's a reason for that, guys. There's a reason for that. So please, I'm not even asking you to be generous. I'm asking you to be a human being and respect other human beings. Donations help. A lot of these projects are funded exclusively on donations. So they need you. OB, Professor Levinson, they need you. And I think, you know, as, as citizens of this society, we all have a, a duty there. But okay, let's talk about hope. Let's talk about, so Obi, what, what happens all of a sudden? I know we, we spoke about this earlier. You hear this woman, Lori Levinson, is coming to help you. You barely see her. The first time you see her is behind plexiglass. She's grilling you on whether or not you knew John. <laughs> hey, stare at me in the eyes when you talk to me, okay? Right, right, right. <laughs> okay, okay. We've, heard the, we've heard the negative. <laughs> you started seeing, and by the way, you were in jail for almost 20 years, let's just be clear here. Um, when you start seeing the wheels going in the positive, when you start seeing, wait a minute, is, yeah. talk to me, <laughs> what's going on there? Yeah, so what happened was I started giving stuff away. Wait a minute, I'm gonna get, hey, you can, you can get this, you can get that. Hey, I don't want that anymore. On the real, like, I, I joke you not, man, like, uh, when I knew that I was on my way back down to the Never Dead Cherry here, it was just like, man, when I when it, put it back up, like when I got the letter, the initial letter from, from the Northern California Innocent Project saying that they was gonna accept the case. And then I got information saying that they was partnering with LPI, uh, a project that was down in Los Angeles. That in itself, now again, that was three, at the beginning part of the three and a half years, that in itself is just like, okay, wow. I got to get on my ball again, right? So now I got to go back into the library. I got to start looking at this and I got to start. So it put this wheel of excitement back into you because hope was there, but they came and energized it. You know what I mean? They came and energized it and then and kept it alive and kept it up and kept it going. So, what, what, what is, I mean, okay. What about when you found out that you were getting out of there? What, what is that? I, I can't even begin to imagine. Hey, look, man. So, you know, I, I talk to the judge sometimes that was involved in the case of Judge Kevin Filer. And I tell him about how he had me sitting there in anxiousness and anticipation as he read through his summation. And I said to him, man, I was so anxious because he had said something early on during the beginning part of the summation that leaned towards that maybe he was going to let me go. And I was just like, just say it. Say it. I can't. I just. It was like rev it up. Like if you ever, you know, I, I watch my little kid now, Ethan, and sometimes when he gets so excited, he just go like this. He squeeze it all in, and he like to get all red and flush and stuff. And that's what it was like. Like the moment when he said it, it's just like yes. And it was. It was. It was all that excitement. But then when, it was just like a relief. Just was just woofed up off of me, bro. Like I just knew that. I, I, I was, I'm going home. Like, it was the most, you know, only thing I can do is just look back at everybody. You know, I looked over at them, like, because we had a moment before that happened. You know, we was, uh, you know, they all came down to the holding tank. And they all, you know, all of them, you know, Miss Levinson, Paige, uh, Linda, Adam, you know, they all came into the tank and they all said, you know, but we don't know how this is going to go. 
And I had to tell them, wait, hey, listen, this is gonna go great. You guys did a fabulous job. Ain't nothing, there's no way possible for the judges not to see the truth of that. Like, I'm excited. So, and they was looking at me like, okay, oh yeah. <laughs> and we all went out, man, and then it actually happened. And it was just like, I don't know, man. It's like, again, like, you know, I tell people now, it's like, if, you, if you're a swimmer, you like the water, and you know, in your first experience with the water may have not been that great. And if you can remember, if you ever had a drowning kind of situation where you thought you was drowning, like, oh, I ain't gonna make it. And, but then somebody pulled you out and you were like, oh man, whew, that's what it was like. They pulled me out. It was just like, whew, thank you. I was, oh my goodness, I was just feeling so good. <laughs> well, what was the first night out like? It was, I was in a bit of a panic, I'll tell you. I can't, I can't even lie. <laughs> I, was, I, was, I was in a bit of a panic. I was in a rush to get away from that county jail. That's the first, let's just get away. Let's just get away. Because, you know, a lot of people don't know this. So I had a, you know, I'll tell you this part, right? And this is an untold thing. So, I, and I don't, you know, put me in mystical, I don't know. But I had a dream way back when I had first got into jail of my sister, my older sister, Stephanie, coming to me with this little green piece of paper saying, hey, uh, you getting out, come on, let's go. And I remember in a dream that I turned around and I seen myself sleep on the ground. And I turned back to my sister and said, come on, let's just go, let's just go, let's just go. And so that day when, when I walked out of the county jail, it was just, come on, let's go, let's go, let's go. Let's get away from this guy. Let's get away from here. And I was like, we, they kept telling me, we're in a Volvo. I could just remember saying, I don't even know what the Volvo looked like. Let's just take me to the car and let's just go. <laughs> but yeah, man, it was like, it was, I was in a bit of a panic, man. I was in a panic, I was a little bit excited. I was more excited, I was excited. You know, and it was just like, I don't know, again, like get, get, getting out that water and land on that ground, bro. It's like land on that ground, you felt so safe. And, you know, I think that's what people kind of, you know, they, they're at their best when they feel safe. And that's what I felt like when I, had, when I got away from there. <laughs> I've had um, someone say to me as an exoneree, they said, look, you know, I, all of a sudden I was able to walk wherever I wanted. I was able to go and do things on my time. And what's that like, that transition back to that? It's, it's, a, it's, it's crazy and difficult, you know? You know, because you, you, you know, you wait all, you want that all of those years. For me, 17 and a half years, I wanted that, right? That freedom of being able to go here and there. And then for the first two and a half years, I, could, I wouldn't go nowhere without Denise, without my fiance, my now wife. Like, I literally had to have somebody by my side because each place that I went to, it was always like, it was just, I was in a panic. Like I was having panic attacks. And it was like, man, I, you know, it's like, it's just, it's the grocery store. She kept telling me it's the store or it's the market. Like she's telling me to calm down. Like, and she's like, when you give speaking engagements over here and there, it's crowds. I was like, yeah, I know. But the crowd is out there. I'm over here. I'm not moving around like in the mall, in the grocery store. I don't know where everybody is at. And uh, it was like that for the first couple of years. And so, and you know, you get, you kind of get, you, you, you kind of find yourself fighting to get away from that kind of way of being. And that's where I'm at to this day, like 10 years later, uh, you know, I still have those kind of, you know, anxiety moments where, you know, and I'm always thinking somebody's following me. That never stops. So. <laughs> Let me and Obi. I know you got to go soon, so I'll try. I'll try to be quick with it. I, I do want to talk about two things, and you know, some of it is regarding the Loyola Project for the Innocent. And Obi, if you got to go, that's fine. I can save that to the end and just speak with the professor. But I wanted to talk with both of you about post-incarceration life, PTSD. Um, you know, you uh, you brought up the grocery store, and Professor, why don't why don't I ask you since you know, you see some of this, I'm sure, as well. Um, what is it? Is there scarring? What, what, what happens? Um, I think it has a profound impact on people's lives. And Obi's very brave, as are the other exonerees. But they have to process so much in life. And I, I just want the viewers to, to remember what you would lose in your life 
if you spent ages 19 to 36 in prison, what would you have missed? And then we have clients who've spent 30, even more years, but you know, for each person, what have you missed in your life? And, and thank God he does have Ethan and Denise now, but you know, he missed many good years. So we try to be sensitive to that. And we try to just sort of be a family, right, Obi? Which is one of the things that I miss most during the pandemic is that every year in my backyard, it's not fancy, but everybody comes and we just barbecue or pass food and hug each other because we all need it. They need the hugs, but frankly, I need the hugs. Um, And I'm grateful. That's what it's like, Daniel. It's like taking people and saying, you're, you're, you're safe. We will always be here for you. It's not like we did your case, check it off the list. You close the file. We never close the file. They're not files. They're people. Mm-hmm. And, they're you not know, files. Yeah. And you know, to add to that is this, is that, you know, you know, sometimes I, you know, I tell people this, I was like, can you, you know, imagine, you know, for me, I grew up in the prison for 17 years and 17 years and a half of my life where it was just, I was not, nothing but male. It was just testosterone every 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year, it's there. And so you don't get out of that conversation, that male to male conversation. And it's a lot, it's about a lot of controlling and dominance and positioning and, and all of those things there. It happens between, you know, alphas and males period. And to have that process for 17 years, on a constant basis, and then to come home, the most difficult part is to having, you know, having that, that man to woman conversation where you find those, where you understand uh, where compromise, put it that way. You understand the compromise where, you know, where you, 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 it's a give and take in the conversation. But, you know, when you grow up in a place, and I was, again, I was young, and so I learned how to not, do that right it was the opposite in there mm-hmm. and now here you have i have to kind of learn to kind of to, to be in that space again in other words to have a feasible and kind of a all, a, a, all right thing with me and my wife even to this very day uh and then with all people with a lot of people because they all say the same thing like you know oh but you talk with this control with this with this and i'm like i don't know what to tell you i don't this is how i talk like it, so, uh, and it's not like, and I tell them, I'm just, I didn't come from a place where I, I had a, I had an opportunity to sugarcoat things or to, to get into that kind of thing. I had to be, it had to be either, it's either black or white. There is no in between. And so, and I literally come from a place like that and then to come out here where it's, I'm in I'm I'm the midst of the rainbow again. And I have to be able to kind of be in those kind of different places. And that's the most challenging thing for being in that place there. Now, you know, I, you know, I, you know, you kind of, you know, I, I strengthen myself. In other words, you know, listening to some of the elders that was there with little sayings to kind of hold on to uh, during the process of there while things are happening because, you know, you know, prison is a place where, you know, it's just, it's just not, you in jail, it's more than that. It's way more than that. And no one out here, whatever, you know, as long as you never go in there and experience it, you would never, and I pray that they don't, uh, you never have to worry about that. But, you know, you don't, you can't be tormented, humiliated, and put all of these things for so many years and then all of a sudden, like, okay, I'm out. Like, I don't have that on me. Like, it's there, you know? And those are the challenging things, in, you know, not only in family relationships, but in personal relationships and in the community relationships when you go out and to do things. And that's why, that's why it's so important for people to, to understand that, you know, when we, when we misspeak about things, you have to understand that that understanding what, what a person takes from that. You know, when they, you can call it, if I call a, a bowl a cup and the person who I'm looking at never seen a bowl or a cup before, I'm, I'm misleading that person now. And so in my place here, it's like, again, like being in there, I'm not who I, who I authentically so supposed to be. 
because that price turned me into something I wasn't supposed to be. I'm not this male, dominant, kind of, you know, all of the time kind of guy. That's not who I am. You know, I feel people and I want to help people. And, but, you know, you know, sometimes, you know, you, you know, your, the conditions of your growing, you know, makes who you are. Well, let me, let me segue to something. You have started your own organization. Is that correct? Yes. Tell us a little bit about that, please. Yeah, so uh, Exonerated Nation, man, uh, you know, me and uh, one another exonerees and Qdellis Rick Walker, who's now rest in peace, you know, we, uh, he and I set out, you know, after, you know, he, me and him talking and, you know, coming home, when I came home, you know, there was nothing going on in the state of California as far as re-entry was concerned in, re in regards to exonerated individuals and for services concerned. And it was like, and like Ms. Levinson said, that they had took up the cloth uh, leave, you know, no disposable person. And so they definitely was continuing to help clothing, found monies for us, shelter us and all of these things. And so I wanted to help her to so that she can continue to get other people like me out and me, you know, I can help individuals when they get out. And so I, we started Exonerated Nation to do that, to be able to, to, to be able to help individuals heal from the debilitating effects of being put in prison for crimes in which they didn't commit. In, in, in all regards. And so we try to help them on the re-entry. So with the immediate needs that they may need, we give them care packages. We have we have temporary job placements. We've been successful with getting the housing bill passed. Uh, we've also been successful with getting the educational bill passed. Uh, there's now, you know, they get gate money now when they walk out of the door. Uh, you know, and so, you know, we're really excited about working in those spaces there. Uh, because, you know, you know, not only does it, is it helping me heal, but I realize the benefit of how it helps them begin the process of healing too as well. Uh, we all have our own journey of healing, uh, but at least there's a door there for us to go through to start it. And, uh, and I don't think that that was there before. And so I'm just, you know, excited to be doing the work. And I assume you guys take donations? Yes, yes, definitely. I mean, like, you know, you mentioned earlier about organizations that that's our survival is is by donations. And, you know, and, uh, when, you know, when people ask me that, like, the first things out of my mouth is that please donate because, uh, you know, my saying is help helps help and hurt hurts hurt. And I've helped in the helpline with Lori Levinson, who's helping other individuals. And I'm asking you to help and hop in the line and say yes and to donate. And to help us to do the work, to help individuals to come home, and to help individuals to re to get themselves readjusted to a community which they've been ripped away from or something they didn't do. What's in those care packages? Out of curiosity. So we have, you know, cosmetics. We put into the care package. We try to put a five hundred dollar gift card in there. We also put some apparel in there with the, uh, you know, Exonerated Nation apparel, informational things where they can find other help at. Uh, you know, just to, you know, and also just let them know how they can stay connected with us um, as we build community. Got it. Okay. And Professor, let me talk to you. We'll start wrapping this up, but let me talk to you about legislation. And let me just talk to you about the state of affairs when it comes to legislation around the wrongfully convicted or convictions in general. What's going on? What changes have been made? And what changes need to be made? Well, there's a lot that's been happening. I'm going to let Obi, since the bill's named after him, talk about Obi's bill. But uh, much of what we needed is to recognize that there needs to be a way for people to go to court and bring the claims that were almost impossible to win. Yeah. You know, for, for example, when there's new scientific evidence and we made it such a high hurdle that someone couldn't point out that we've learned about the forensics, we've learned about the fake evidence that was presented as scientific. So those standards have changed. We have in terms of supporting people who get out, uh, you know, an assistance bill that, you know, but the showing has to be that they're factually innocent. And again, the standard was nearly impossible to meet that just so that they could get the money for the time that they were in prison. So that has changed too. Here's another thing, the substantive laws. You know, we have so many young men, and it's primarily men, but not only, we represent women as well, who were put in prison as young people because they were in a car where someone did a drive-by shooting. Not a good thing to do, but they never pulled the trigger. They didn't put together this plan. 
and yet they got life sentences. And mm-hmm. so the laws have been changing in that area as well. There are proposals right now to reassess this horrible sentencing structure. We have had so many enhancements that you know people commit a crime and they never get another chance. And so the new laws regarding resentencing are critical. The person somebody is when they're 17, 19 years old are not the people they are when they're 35. And to sort of fill up our prisons, this is cheating the taxpayer. Why are you keeping someone in prison? They're not a danger. And you've sort of said to them, your life is not worth anything ever again. So, uh, Obi, can you talk a little bit about Obi's bill? Because it is something special. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Uh, so, Obi's law, you know, it was an opportunity to kind of get our kind of get a, a step in the door when it came to um, California legislators. And But what happened was that I was actually there talking to um, legislators by um, a request by Tom Amiano at the time on prosecutorial misconduct. And um, as I was walking around the halls, talking to legislators and assembly individuals, you know, a lot of them was interested in the story of what was going on, what had happened, and was concerned, like, asking me what was going on now. Like, what how am I doing now? What are you doing? Like, are you working and having those, you know, all of those familiar questions, all of those questions. And, and, I, and I was expressing to them that, like, I'm still trying to find a job. Uh, I've been having difficulty because I had I didn't have no ID. Um, I didn't have no place. And so I'm talking to him about all of the things that wasn't there. And then maybe a couple of weeks later, I get a call from the Hernandez Strategy Group and Ignacio Hernandez uh, indicating that the uh, assembly individuals uh, heard my story, heard and felt my story, and felt that there was something that they needed to do. And they had, and he said that they had assembled a bill, which is at that point was called AB 672. Uh, and it, it, it was surrounding uh, helping individuals with housing, mental health, uh, education, jobs, social workers, and all of the things that at least those individuals, that, at least the things that individuals that was getting that was coming on on probation and parole, that you can at least give the exonerated person those things there if you don't want to do anything else. And so, um, you know, uh, and he, he said, well, and they also want to call it Obi's Law. I said, what? Yeah. <laughs> He said, what? I was like, wait a minute. I was like, he's like, and then, yeah, they wanted me to ask you if it was okay. How are you going to ask me? They the law. They can, they, can do, <laughs> they the law. They can do what they want to do. I can't tell them no. But I said, no, they're going to still do it if they want to do it. Yeah, they can do it. So uh, that's how Obi's Law came about. Um, again, it was, uh, again, sharing my story, uh, talking to him about the conditions of what, how it was when I walked out of the door, not having no job, the fact that uh, I ended up uh, took up a year and I ended up getting a job through a, you know, went speaking there at, at Loyola. Uh, and it was a student in Brooke Levin who had then went home and said something to her dad about, you know, it was a guy who had been wrongfully convicted and dad who's looking for work. And he got me a job and started me to work and I got a permanent job through that. And so, you know, I, that's what I was, and I was talking to him about those things and how and the length of which that took uh, and the lift that it took for me to get my ID and the lift that it took for me to get a birth, my birth, and all of these things. And so uh, AB 672 came about, and uh, Obi's Law came into effect. And I'm, you know, really, uh, I'm grateful because it was an opportunity, like I said, for us to go back to talk about uh, the legislative things that needs to happen, or other conversations that surrounding, you know, when we walk out of the door, gay money, medical, uh, looking at uh, having, you know, Cal Fresh, at least, you know, they need food. What about food? We walk out of the door. Money, we walk out of the door. It takes up to this much time here before an individual could anything. And so, you know, I was grateful that those things, that they moved and acted on that uh, and, and, and put those things in implementation in the state of California. So, Well, that's wonderful to hear. Um, I know that we've gone longer than I, I said we would, and I think for good reason. And uh, look, if it was up to me, I have questions from now till infinity. I have so many more things I want to ask you. Uh, Obi, I would love to talk to you more about Exonerated Nation. I want to talk to you about exonerees and what the post-exoneration life is like. And frankly, I invite you back if you want to even produce a panel with me and bring other exonerees on board. I have questions and I, I think people at home would be enriched by hearing that type of stuff. And 
Professor, same for you. You're talking about, you know, this this issue has now even become political. Uh, there's a recall that potentially might be going forward. There's a lot to be discussed about how it is we do crime and punishment in the state of California, and you would be an invaluable resource. And so, of course, I invite you to come back as well. We'd love to have these conversations with you guys, but I, I want to be respectful of your time. So I have one question left for the two of you, and it's a simple, straightforward question. Um, Obi, let's start with you. If I said to you, insofar as wrongful convictions are concerned, what is the number one thing the average person can do? What would it be to help? Donate to the organizations that's doing the work. That's the first thing. First thing off, donate to the organizations that's doing the work. Then after you donate, go get involved. Ask questions. Figure out how you can volunteer your time. Figure out how you can possibly volunteer some assistance um, because uh, it's what Ms. Levinson said early on in respect to helping those individuals that that are, that are more or less fortunate and also that needs to help fighting for those individuals who can't fight for themselves. And that helps to do that. Professor, what about you? What would you say? As always, Opie's right. You know, be an angel and help us find other angels. It is true, Daniel, as you said, any amount helps because just showing that support, you'll be part of the family. And then you might know people who really can help us do this. We, we started this project. My husband still doesn't know that I wrote a check from our personal <laughs> account. Um, and we apply for grants everywhere we can, but it really the heart and soul are people from the community, people who meet you know, OB or others and say, I want a better system. It makes me crazy when I hear people say, well, you know, it's just the system. No, it's not. There is no quote system. There are people and you can help make those people's lives better. So, you know, I'm a little shy about making pitches, but I, I'm going to make it because it matters so much. We cannot do this work without financial support. We need to pay for experts. We need to do investigations. We need to go to court. My staff already, frankly, gets paid so little that I'm afraid I'll be arrested for paying below minimum wage sometimes. <laughs> uh, they do it and they live a very modest life because they believe in the work. So they're making the ultimate sacrifice, but I need to help them be able to help others. So yes. That matters. And volunteering as well, to the extent that you're out there and you're a lawyer and you realize, I just don't want to do one more boring case. I can promise you the cases you do for us, not boring, not boring <laughs> in the least. Well, I'll say this. I'm, I'm not <clears throat> shy about making the pitch. And, and here's how I would phrase it. You could literally have the most unproductive day of your life. I don't care if you've laid in bed all day. But if in that day you make a donation to this organization, people will run with that money and they're not doing small things. They're doing big things. They're doing big things for people who have the same nervous system that you and I have, who suffer just like you and I suffer. Don't pretend these people don't exist. Don't pretend they're wrongfully convicted don't exist. They're there. Someone is in jail right now who should not be. How would you feel if that was you? And when you put it in that context, ladies and gentlemen, donations are not that hard. And, and, and look, whatever you can do to help, whoever you can get involved, just like the professor said, we're going to put all the links down below on this. And this is the point at which I, I don't know how to say thank you, um, Obi. I don't know. I don't know. I don't have the, for a guy who has a lot of words, I don't have the words. Um, thank you. Thank you. I, I know I, this wasn't easy, my friend. I know this wasn't easy. I, you know, any, I, I shared a company with, with Ms. Levis and she eases the, she eases, she's like my calmer, you know, you got your yin and your yang and you keep each other balanced. And that's what it is. And so I love to do these things. And I'm always, you know, I'm always the one. I understand the difference between use and misuse. And I ask to be used because I want to be in the helpline. And so thank you for calling me up on the show. And I definitely appreciate the offer to come back. And I look forward to being able to do so. Uh, I think this is a wonderful experience. I appreciate you. And Daniel, I don't know if you know the legal term, being a mensch. But uh, Obi Anthony is as are you. It takes a lot and I try hard, frankly, not to put Obi through this, but I knew your heart, Daniel, was in the right place. And I thank you, Obi, for taking time from putting Ethan to bed tonight 
<laughs> and having dinner with Denise yeah. and reliving this to let everybody else know, come on, folks, step up, make the world better. It is not an isolated case. You didn't ask me, Daniel, how many people are in prison who are innocent, but our current estimate is about 5%, which mm -hmm. means about 100,000 people oh serving possible life sentences, most of them the most serious crimes, are waiting for our help. And, you know, I'm doing it as fast as I can. <laughs> I can't do it alone. Right. All right, guys. Thank you, Daniel. Intense, intense episode. You're both welcome back. Sincerely, Professor Levinson, Obi Anthony, guys, thank you so much. Everyone at home, let's scroll down, check out those links. I'll put everything you need to see down below. Thank you both again, and the people who are listening at home, thank you for listening as well. 